precedent, I guess I'll, I'll welcome you all here to the meeting. Thanks for coming. And I uh, hope I can serve you well here the next few years. Uh, as is customary, let's go around the tables and introduce ourselves. Just uh, want to stand or not stand, doesn't matter. But uh, why don't we start here? Steve? Steve Walter with Industrial Risk Insurance. Bill Davis, Industrial Risk Insurance. Uh, Bruce Smith with Royal Alliance. Ken Futrell Blair. Uh, Sandy Agastol. Agastol is so Linda French with North Star Fire Protection. Mike Breeze, Silver Mechanical Fire Protection Division. Andy Marosha with Mike. Bruce Sutter, ATS North. Tony Martin, Global Risk Consultants. Warren Anderson, South Fire Protection. Dave Wood, Response Fire Protection. Tommy Attell, Chef Clear. Dave Nelson, Nelson Engineering Sales. Mark Ewing, Rock Vesta Serpentine. Matt Bresnahan, Rock Vesta Serpentine. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just talk about a, a few items we've been discussing. Excuse my cough here a little bit. As you may have noticed, we raised the dues a little bit. Um, we were actually in a deficit position here the last year, and so we moved things up a little bit so that we're at least breaking even. And we think with this new dues scheme that uh, we should be able to make some money. And uh, I'll let Ken talk to that a little bit here because he's the treasurer uh, in a little bit. We've got. Uh, Next month's meeting is going to be special hazards design and equipment put on to by Reliable and uh, Reliable Automatic Sprinkler, Mark Conroy. And we were all questioning ourselves as to what exactly is he going to be talking about. And since he's not here, we don't know. So <laughs> that's anybody's best guess on that one. As uh, you probably all know, we videotape each of these meetings. And uh, I know from my own experience, that's been very helpful to pick up a videotape watch it at home on the TV. You can uh, zoom through parts you want to listen to. And to listen to the other parts is very helpful. And uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, we did the buffet style tonight instead of the sit-down meals. And I guess we're looking for any input you have on that, whether you liked it or not liked it. Or didn't like it. So. Maybe uh, if you have comments later on about uh, which way you'd like to see that in the future, let us know. We save a few bucks by doing it the buffet way, and uh, that way if, if we have people that uh, say they're coming and they don't come up, we don't lose as much money as we do with the single plate scenario. Uh, so with that, I'm going to have uh, Ken come up and give our uh, treasurer's report, tell you where we're at financially. This won't be very long. So. We have uh, currently $829 in our account. And our goal is to, for, uh, to do is to bring in speakers, uh, maybe some high-profile speakers from across the country and pay for their flights and their hotel while they're in town. So that's what we're trying to achieve. All right. Well, uh, today we have uh, uh, a couple of uh, people from Ross Best. Rock Vestos Supernet. We have uh, Mark Ewing and Matt Briz, Brisnahan. And uh, we also have uh, Dave Nelson representing Nelson Engineering, who's the, who's the distributor for their project. Uh, Manufacturer's rep. Manufacturer's rep. And uh, they'll be talking a little bit about codes related to uh, insulated electrical cables. That's pretty important for feeding fire pumps and they have some products that have to do with fire alarm wiring. So uh, without saying much more about it, uh, Mark Ewing uh, is going to you know, help me in welcoming him. Well, it's warming up. Uh, again, my name is Mark. I'm basically my responsibilities on the Western Regional Manager for 
Rock Best is served not, who's an engineering wire and cable manufacturer. I basically handle, I'm right at my, kind of right at my edge right here. I handle everything west of Minnesota. Matt handles basically Wisconsin and east. So we've kind of got a little bit of a territory. Uh, appreciate, you know, you guys giving us the opportunity. We met with Ken and Phil about, probably about a month ago and explained to what we had, what, what our intentions were, trying to introduce our cable to the market. And by doing so, we wanted it you know, to be in a, in a, an approach that you guys can hopefully educate you on not just codes, but the newest, the newest products that are out there. So I appreciate you giving us the opportunity. Uh, I'm not, I know I'm not the high profile speaker, but hopefully what I have to offer is, you know, educational to you. So uh, again, also for Tom, this is kind of directed for Tom, Tom and Sandy. Uh, Please interact with me. I mean, when I, when I say something, if you guys have a question, if anybody has a question, feel free to you know, kind of chime in at any time. You don't need to wait till the end. I'm kind of a, a pretty relaxed presentation. So, uh, jump right in again. This is me. Basically, there's four key purposes of my presentation. We're going to discuss current systems that comply with three different articles. One of them, 695, that's basically your fire pumps, 700, your emergency systems, and 760, are your fire alarm systems. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the survivability of fire alarm systems as a, as a complete package. And basically when you think about the survivability, you're talking what makes those fire alarm systems operate. And it's the wire. We're going to get into that. Uh, inform you of the newest UL listed type CI, circuit integrity cables. And going to go through, I'm going to go through the test. I don't know if anybody's seen the actual test that fire, fire rated cables have to go through to get that designation as a fire rated cable. And these are the three three areas that they're addressed: fire pumps, emergency systems, fire alarm systems. The first half, kind of first half of the presentation is going to go through fire pumps and emergency systems, and followed up by the fire systems. A couple other related codes. When I talk about fire alarm systems in the National Electric Code, you're going to see what it, it, it classifies wiring, it classifies certain applications. The actual National Fire Alarm Code, NFP 72, talks about where those cables are required why they're required. So I'll kind of go over a couple codes in there. Uh, the uniform fire code, you guys might be familiar with it, smoke exhaust fans. You're in some of your larger warehouses, we'll explain, I'll kind of run through that actual code where fire rated cables could be used. Uh, this is, I'm going to start with this because the rest of it's NEC, the uniform fire code. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with standard 81.3. Basically what it says is when you're inside of a building, when you're running your smoke exhaust fans, when you run your wires through the building, they have to be thermally protected. This code right here calls out for a minimum of 15 minutes, 1,000 degrees rating. And if you go and, you know, we've, we've had some people going and searching, trying to find a cable that is listed for that. And it's, uh, some people are under the misunderstanding that, you know, if they run just standard THH and wire or any kind of standard building wire and EMT conduit, that that conduit gives them the fire protection. And majority of people are starting to understand that it doesn't, it doesn't give you any fire protection. I'll show you later how long that's going to last. So basically, this cable that I'm going to talk about, the Vitaline cable, is one of the alternatives to supplying this. You're going to see a lot of contractors, what they're doing is to, to get away from this code, they're going to run their wire and their conduit outside the building. That's the exception. If you run outside the building, you don't have to maintain a fire rate. So. 6956, again, is fire pump wiring, your power wiring, your circuit conductors. There's three different things. It says it can be encased in two inches of concrete. You're going to see that probably on all your new construction. It's your most, you know, it's your most economical way of doing it. You can meet the code. Another one is with an enclosed structure having a minimum one hour fire rating. Also, gypsum board, five inch gypsum board, you can build, a, you know, build an encasement around it. Or if it's installed in a listed electrical circuit protective system. There's kind of a, a gray area between the electrical system or electrical circuit protective system and a thermal barrier system. I'm going to kind of explain two of those, but I'm going to explain a couple and show you a couple different systems. Uh, also in 700-9, it talks about the same thing. What's required? These are your emergency systems. They can be smoke exhaust fans, emergency generators, things like that. If it's installed, this, I, I didn't tell you, I think you guys are on the 93 code. Is that correct, 93 code? NEC? Yeah, Minnesota. So what I'm, the, the code book I'm referencing here is the 99 code, so it might be a little bit up, but I'm, I don't know. I was under the impression that you guys might be skipping the 96 or jumping. Well, it's not there on 99 like and 70. Okay. But on the uh, alarm code 72, they're on 93. 
Okay, this is 99 in, in a 70. So again, you can use an electrical circuit protective system. Or this is where, where it gets different. You can be protected by a listed thermal barrier system. And again, I'll show you the difference. It's basically there's a difference in the UL test. These are three acceptable ways found to meet what's called an electrical circuit protective system. You're going to kind of hear that over and over. I'm going to kind of, you know, that's going to be talked about a lot. But your conduit or your duct trap type of system. You can go run your standard conduit, put some, say, some 3M wrap around it. That's one of the alternatives of meeting the code compliance code. Uh, fire resistive and mineral insulated cable. I don't know if, is anybody familiar with MI cable? You guys, anybody know what that is? Or I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that. The newest cable, kind of the one I'm here to talk about somewhat, is the fire rated MC cable. Definition, or actually these are fire resistive cables. What it is in an electrical circuit protective system, it's the ability of the cables to remain electrically functional during the, basically a fire. It's the, that's the general definition. You can read the exact definition, but you want these cables and you want these wires to continue to operate during a fire. You consider what speed you feed your fire pump. Your fire pump is supplying all your fire your sprinklers. So it's got to work in the, in the event of a fire. So that's kind of the bottom line of what that is. The biggest question is how does UL address this? You, know, you can't just say, I've got a cable, I know it'll pass a fire test. You know, you've got to really, you know, you've got to go through a pretty strenuous test. The standards on it is UL standard 1724, and the new standard for fire resistant cable is now 2196. You're going to hear a little bit about both of them. But, uh, the fire endurance, it's a, a test that the fire actually gets up to 1,850 degrees for a time frame of two hours. So this isn't a, you know, just a little campfire we're throwing our cable in. It's a severe test. I'm going to show you some video on it so you get an understanding. And the difference between an electrical list, a list, listed electrical circuit protective system and a thermal barrier system is at the end. The electrical circuit protective system has to go through a two and a half inch plate pipe hose stream. It's basically to insinuate a fireman's hose. So it's gonna go through, it's gonna test the thermal shock, mechanical strength, things like that. This is a picture, this is just kind of a graph showing the actual temperature curve. It shows you how quick the temperature rises for the initial 15 to 30 minutes, and then from then on it just kind of gradually goes up. Another kind of a, not necessarily a graph, but again, it shows you the temperature rise. This is the actual test at UL. Again, you have to go to UL, supply it with your cables, show them exactly what you have, and go through what their standard is. You're going to see, see the standard, the pipe right here, the standard strut. One of the advantages that this cable offers, you can see it here, you can use standard strut. MI cable, which is the only other cable on the market, you have to use special straps. Everything has to come specifically from the manufacturer of the cable. This cable offers the contractors using it, and you know, can go and he can get competitive prices. He's not stuck with one system. He uses standard stuff that he's used to using. This is the back of the wall. This kind of just runs through. It's just showing you how the setup is, what it takes to, you know, to get going with this. These are the actual wires coming out. Right here, this is, you saw the white, see the white on the right side, that's the actual fire stop suppression system. There's the cable, you can, if you notice there's a, there's a jacket on the cable. Uh, the jacket is actually just a PVC jacket. And what UL said to us is if you test with the jacket on, obviously if you pass with the jacket, you're gonna pass without. That jacket's just gonna add fuel to the fire basically. So what we did is we wanted to be able to do that in case somebody wanted a jacket. We haven't sold any, I don't think, with a jacket yet, but there is some people who require it. I used a story in Vegas, I think I might have told you guys a story in Vegas, where the, the actual MI cable was run up on the ceiling, and a plumber came in, thought it was a water pipe, and he cut into the MI cable and killed himself. So Vegas is an example where they're actually considering, you know, they want us to run, they want us to run uh, PVC, like a red PVC to signify an emergency surgery. <coughs> After you get to set everything set up, one of the things, I don't know if you notice the strut. You'll notice in a few minutes, the actual strut, everything has to be spaced accordingly. So however you test at that wall is how your listing is. It's how it's got to be. It's got to be mounted and supported a certain way. So you'll notice, see the, there's the lights, and everything, everything's hooked up. But the sport, it's kind of, it's important. I mean, you're going to see MI cable. You may see MI cable just run on the floor. You might see it run on the ceiling. Not necessarily 
in accordance with the UL building material record. So it's really neat. It's important to do that because that's the way the cable was tested. It wasn't tested anywhere other than that. Here he's just turning on all the gas, everything that's going. It takes him a little while. actual fire. You can see that these are the actual cables right in here. So again, you can see it's not a small fire. This is the cable, this little copper cable right here. This is the cable that you see in the fire right there. And again, it's, it's supported at a certain distance. It's got to be, you know, it's got to be supported that way. This is the same test that the MI cable went through. This is the test that you have to pass to get a fire rated cable. See, kind of, it's going around the actual actual cable. That's the PVC jacket burning off. You can see some. If you notice a little smoke coming out of the ends of the cables, what that is, this is a silicone, proprietary silicone. So what it does when it sees about, it's about 900 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going through what's called a ceramification process. This silicone will actually end up turning into a ceramic. So as it's going through that process, it's going to put off some liquids and some gases, and it's not toxic, not corrosive, non-conductive. It's not. It's not a problem. If it is a problem, and you're not, you know, you don't want smoke going into the controller, then we offer, you know, you can. We recommend terminate it into a junction box so that smoke won't enter any 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 devices. See, I mean, you just saw the temperature before, about 1,500 degrees at an hour. 1,700 degrees after what, an hour and 15 minutes. So it's a hot, it's a hot fire. Two hours. Basically, it's right below the melting point of copper. And that's why people have asked us, why don't you use an aluminum, you know, an aluminum cover, basically, or a conduit, so to speak, to lower the cost and do things like make it easier to work with, but you know, melt aluminum would melt. So. There's the lights. Those lights are kind of, those are heat. You have to watch those lights. Those lights go out, your cable fails. Basically what you saw, that's, that's the first half of the test, and that's not necessarily the hardest part of the test. The hardest part is kind of, you notice the glowing red. I mean, they're hot. they got to come out. Was it within a minute? They have to come out of that. Yeah, the three minutes they have to come out of that oven, and here's the there, here's the hose spray. Notice he's hitting every single cable. He's not just spraying water up there; he's hitting it directly. You can notice the smoke coming off. You can notice the bricks. This guy's going to start sweeping up bricks. Again, he's testing the thermal shock and the mechanical strength of the cable. Notice it sags a little. That's why typical MC cables supported every six feet. When you go to test, you don't test, you're probably not going to pass at six feet. So you go in, you test either directly down at two or three feet. So your initial test is you know pretty close together. So you can you can get your list and you get your list, and then once you get that, we go and we try and enhance that list and we try to you know increase the support. So now we're you know we're at we're out of time now where we're at four feet on the larger cables, three feet on the smaller cables, so we're you know we're getting as, as user friendly as you can basically. The listing is at two feet. No, the initial test is done at two feet, and then once you get past that, then you go back and you test again at four feet. You do the same exact thing at four feet, and that's what you. That's how you increase your listing. That's basically what that is. That's the, that's the test that everyone has to go. Every company that's trying to get a fire rated cable or a listed electrical circuit protective system or a cable, that's what they have to go through. That test you just saw. So well, it kind of gives you an understanding why it's. There's not a lot of cables out. Okay, during the water spray, the uh, light bulbs were still continuing to uh, be uh, under power? Or no, not under power during the, during the water spray. Okay. They do, they do un un look at it on the water spray, but then they hook it right back up after, the water after they dry. The cables dry. 
their lab set not set up to spray the water and have electrical integrity and safety. So at the same time. That's what I read in the Environment. For those of you who aren't familiar with MI cable, I will talk a little bit about MI cable. That's the only other cable besides this one to pass the test that you just saw. MI cable has been on the market for 50, probably 15 years. And it's been it's been a sole source cable. You, you might hear a lot of contractors there. You know they kind of try to get away from it. They're not they don't necessarily like using it. It's very expensive. It's hard to use. This is what it looks like. It's solid conductors. It's a magnesium oxide basically compacted, compacted into a, a, a copper tube. So they're limited on length, things like that. So it's a good cable for certain applications, but people just, you know, it's not a user-friendly cable. It's not easy to work with. This is their listing number. This is, they're listed as, in this book here, as system number 10. This is pretty, a key book when you're looking at listed electrical circuit protective systems. This basically in here, if you go to, say, our test, it will give you all the details of what we went through, our supports, how it was supported to the wall, the distance it was supported. So you find that, you find both MI cable and our cable in there, and everything should comply with that listing. MI cable, basically, one of the main things, it's gotta be supported to a minimum two hour fire rated wall. So if you were to go into a building and see a, you know, some MI cable run on this wall, that's basically does not comply with code. So you're gonna have a, you know, a little discrepancy if versus your code issues. Uh, it may or may not include a factory installed welded joint. It's in parentheses because it's right out of the book. Basically what that's saying is if it, it can't have a splicer in it, MI cable because it comes in short lengths. You can splice it, but it's got to be done at the factory. And you'll, you'll probably see 95% of the jobs where they're going to come out and field splice it. Once you field splice it, you do not have a two-hour fire rated UL listed cable. You now have a factory or manufacturer's two-hour fire rated cable. So kind of one of the other things, cables must pass continuously through a fire rated area, minimum 12 inches beyond. Basically all that means is once you go into your fire rated room, you gotta go at least a foot inside it before you do whatever, your, your controller, if you want to splice it into THHN, whatever it has to be, it's gotta be a minimum of a foot inside that room. And there's supports. There's supports in the UL building material directory, it's every 39 inches. When I say supports, it's, you know, you're running strut, they can't actually use strut. They've got to use, it's, it's in there, they've got to use special special brackets, special straps that are only supplied by them. And it's got to be every 39 inches, maximum every 39 inches. It can't exceed 39 inches basically. The Vitalink MC, that's the MC cable. That's what it looks like. A couple things that you might notice right away, stranded conductors. All your, all your equipment that you're terminating, your fire pump controllers, whatever it may be, the lugs aren't rated for a solid conductor. So the MI cable has to go through a termination kit. They call it a speed term or a quick term kit. So they've got, these contractors have to go take these cables, terminate, and splice on a, a, a stranded conductor. That's not easy to do. It's, again, it's time consuming. So that's one of the key advantages to the uh, Vitalink cable. Vitalink cable is UL listed type MC cable. It's in accordance with NEC standard 334 and UL standard 1569. It goes through all the same pass the test. You first have to pass everything to become classified as a certain type of cable. So, you know, we said, okay, we want to become classified as a type MC. So we do everything to comply with that, and then you go to UL and you get your two hour firing. So this is also listed as a type MC cable. It has power control and lighting cable rated 600 volt, 90 degree C. Additional standards. Low smoke classification, it's also listed for cable tray use, and it also passed the IEC 331 flame test, which the modified is uh, three hours at 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Some key points we kind of already talked about, it's electrical circuit protective system. In this book, it's listed as FHIT. That's the, the four letter, co letter code for that system. Uh, again, it's system number 17, and it complies with UL standard 1724. 2196. This is a picture of our listing. It just kind of shows you what's in here, what you first see. Uh, again, ours is, needs to be supported to a two-hour rated wall or assembly. So it's got to, you know, you can't, you can't just run our cable on the wall or wherever you want to run it. Uh, the cable, again, must pass continuously through a fire rated area and terminate 12 inches beyond a fire rated area. So it's very similar in this sense to the MI cable. 
The supports, this is one of the advantages that the contractors have on this cable. Your supports are a lot better, I should say a lot better, they're a foot better on larger sizes. When you're talking about a large run, you know, you get a 500 foot run, that's a pretty big difference in supports and struts. So, uh, again, it can be fastened to the wall by two, one quarter inch diameter by three quarter inch masonry anchors. anchors. This is just a standard strut and pipe clamp. Steel, cannot be aluminum. One of the things, you know, some people want to say, well, why don't I put aluminum, it's cheaper to do. But aluminum won't last in the fire and cables will fall off. The clamps, again, unjacketed. If it's unjacketed, it's a two-piece single bolt pipe clamp just like that. If you do jacket it, it's got to be a certain kind of a special clamp that will, that will hold the cable in place when the jacket burns off. Some of the disadvantages, I won't get into a lot of them, these are, these are really, some of them are engineering, some of them are contracting, but these are some of the reasons why people, you know, basically are very happy that this cable is finally out there. Wide range of sizes, you know, on the literature that you got, on the MC literature, on the back it shows you all the sizes it's manufactured in, all the way from a two conductor 14 up to a three conductor 750 and a four conductor 500. The MI cable, the largest multi-conductor cable, that you can get an MI is a three conductor four and a four conductor six. So basically what that means, if you take for example a fire pump, 100 horsepower fire pump, it's got to have a two watt cable. But if, you, if the contractor were going to use an MI cable, he's got to have three or four poles of MI cable. Because they only make a single conductor. The Vitalink MC cable, they can make one pole to get all their conductors under one sheet. So you can imagine, just, just thinking about that, you can imagine the labor that they're going to save. Lengths, again, is a very big issue. You, you, I showed you the, the, the splicing information on the UL book. It's in, it ranges from $450 to $565 for a splice. And again, keep that in mind, on larger sizes, you're talking about three or four conductors. So that's three or four splices. Where this cable, you know, a four conductor six of our Vitalink MC cable, we manufacture a continuous run of 3,000 feet. So you don't have any issues with splicing. You don't have any problems with splicing. And that's actually, that's been probably one of the biggest deals that the contractors like because they don't have to deal with splices. <coughs> Stricken and terminated. If you're not familiar with MI cable, ask a, an electrical contractor who's used it. And his biggest problem is the stripping and terminating it. I explained to you how it's got to go from a solid conductor to a stranded conductor. This is the kit that they have to use. These are all the little pieces just to get it from a solid to stranded. These are the contents of it. It kind of runs through you know, two sets of brass terminations, two TMB end along barrel connectors, heat shrink tubing, stranded wire. These are the tools required. So that's what it, that's what's involved in it. This is everything that you need. A better a better way to get an understanding of what you need is right there. That's what a contract you've got to have just to terminate the type of my cable. So you can see one of the reasons why they don't enjoy using the cable. It's not their favorite thing. And on top of all these tools, it's not something they're using every day. They might use it once a year. And when they do use it, you know, they're not familiar with it. They gotta go and buy all these tools from the manufacturer, things like that. But our Vitaling MC, those are the tools you need. Basically, you take a standard pipe cutter, this copper sheath will score off, peels right out like that. This is a silicone again, it's kind of it's kind of a soft silicone, it slices right back and peels off. You're already a stranded conductor, so you go directly into it. And it's, you know, it's quick. It's quick and it's easy and it's type MC. So contractors are familiar with MC cable. Moisture issue. This is kind of a big issue with MI cable. If you're not familiar with it again, the MI cable, if you're not, if you don't terminate it and you don't watch yourself what you're doing, MI cable, that magnesium oxide is very susceptible to moisture. You get moisture in there, and the biggest thing is if you get too much moisture and you don't terminate quick enough, you may not know. You go to Meg and you might you, know, you might get an okay Megger Meg reading, but you know, if you do get too much moisture, some people say, well, what's, what's the big deal? For example, if it's, if it's connected to a fire pump, that fire pump's not going to start. That's a pretty big deal when you consider what you're talking about. I mean, it's a life safety cable, and if it doesn't start, it's kind of a, kind of a little problem. But that's basically the rundown on the, on the uh, MC cable. I'll actually kind of pass a couple of these around. These are the connectors. This is a rather a large piece, but that's just the breakdown on the MC. Again, you know, we can show you codes in here where the, where the cable's required. It talks about it more, but again, if you have any questions on it, feel free to ask. 
myself or Matt or Dave. Um, on that, we'll kind of, I'm going to jump right into the, the firework here. Try not to take too much time. But. Mark, can you give us a flavor of the cost of unit prices on that day? You know, see. Uh, in relation to, let's say, 100 horsepower firework. Three conductor, two watt, you're probably looking at. Yeah. You got Two watt. Yeah. I think it's probably 22 or 23. Three conductor, two watt with MI cable, you'd be looking at about $31, with us, you'd be looking about 27 So it is, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a lot more expensive than. You know, standard wiring conduit. But when you're talking about complying with the code, you got to have a minimum one hour fire rating. You know, it's a lot. Retrofit is basically where you're going to see this cable. That's your biggest application. It exists because the building already exists. You can't bury something in concrete. You can run this right up all the steel or all the uh, all the concrete walls. So yes. The price was at was thirty one dollars for MI. Is that per phase? Is per foot. Per foot. Right, foot. but there's you need three. That, I'm doing a three conductor cable on ours, so that's three, three conductors, yeah, yeah. three feet of them. Now, the big savings of the MC cable obviously comes at a contractor's level. We usually can say you're going to pretty much see about a 10% savings on the cable itself, but the contractors, we've had numbers thrown to us at at least 30% on total, total installed cost savings. I showed it to a contractor down in Rochester here, but three months ago or two months ago after the fact on a job and he said if he had seen it before he did the job he would have probably been able to save uh, a third of the labor involved in installment. Uh, now that the cable that you guys most of your passengers are looking at a little red cable that you know looks like it's a regular fire alarm cable we kind of explain that what the reason it looks like a typical fire alarm cable, here's what a typical fire alarm cable is. 16 gauge, PVC with jacket on it, two conductors twisted, you know, PVC jacket. So it's not that much different than a standard fire alarm cable, but as you're gonna learn in the next few minutes, there's a pretty big difference between the two. That's a picture of a standard fire alarm cable. So what you're looking at, a standard fire alarm cable, you know, the size, this is maybe a little bit bigger than a standard fire alarm cable. One of the things, when you look at a standard fire alarm cable, you look at this FPL, when you look at the little, the R that's going to go on it, the R stands for riser. Basically, some people will get the misunderstanding that riser basically means circuit integrity. Basically means if it's got an R on it, that means that cable is going to last. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to quit on you in a fire. All the riser does, it basically does a test and it will say, okay, it's going to go from this floor to this floor. Will this cable propagate, the, will the flame propagate and will it spread from floor to floor? Will it rise? And that's what the test is. The test doesn't test the integrity of the cable. It tests to see if it's going to rise from floor to floor. <coughs> now, what is, assuming a standard fire alarm cable, what would you guess and what would you hope that a standard fire alarm cable would last in a fire? This is a, a 12,000 BTU flame. I started a little too early, so I got a, I'm gonna get the got a good sight. <laughs> Generally, we the tip, most typical answer is probably between 10 and 20 minutes. Most people, you know, they're hoping that it lasts 10 to 20 minutes, along with the fact that, you know, you would just assume that it would a, a fire alarm cable. Right? Why wouldn't it last 10 to 20 minutes at least? Twenty nine seconds. The standard, basic standard fire alarm cable. That's an FPLR cable that you just saw in the beginning. Probably what a lot of buildings have in their fire alarm system, a lot of your high-rise buildings. But what I get in most jurisdictions is, yeah, but we put ours in conduit. Everything goes in conduit. It's required to be in conduit, so we're fine. What would your guess be on a conduit, cable in conduit? Probably going to be longer than this, but what would you think? Would you think 10, 20 minutes? Hopefully. Nobody wants to guess, huh? Yeah, 10, 20 minutes. See the lights, these are the lights. The fire just, just now comes under them. There's no point in me just sitting here with five goes, but you can't see any fire, you can't see anything done. So I'll kind of just go right through it. 67 seconds. So it is a lot longer, it's twice as long, you know. 
think of it that way, twice as long as you throw some conduit in there. But bottom line, 67 seconds, your firearm papers. I don't know when you guys were the last last time you were in a high-rise building, but you know, Matt and I have been traveling around, we're staying in all these different hotels, and all we think about is, huh, we're on the ninth floor tonight, you know, if there's a fire, how long is it going to take me to get from the ninth floor out of this building? I don't know about you guys, but it's going to take me longer than a minute just to, you know, get out of bed and get downstairs. I mean, so it's something, it's a serious thing, the codes are recognizing it, all the, all the people on the fire alarm code are starting to realize it, putting all their minds together and starting to take it a little bit more serious. Well, the other thing is, <laughs> how many times you've been in a hotel and the alarm goes off and quits? And does everybody leave the rest of the way out? Or is, do you make the assumption that it's a false alarm you go back to bed? Yeah, it's, almost everybody does that. <laughs> I don't anymore. <laughs> no, I don't either. But <laughs> <laughs> This is another case. This has kind of become popular in the, in the past few years. Rhode Island, for example, has a requirement. It's a two-hour requirement or one-hour requirement? Rhode Island has two hours. Rhode Island has a two-hour requirement on all fire alarm cables. So basically, this company who makes this cable went in and said, we've got a two-hour fire in cable. You see this cable installed throughout Rhode Island. I mean, in probably every building in Rhode Island. And I believe it was Matt did a, did a presentation down there, showed him this, showed him this video, explained to him, and, once he popped this video up there, this was for inspectors, they, uh, everybody said, oh, we know that cable, that's in all our buildings. And they got all excited, like, we're going to show their cable and how good it was. Yeah. And a little bit of Madison Spay, I mean, he, it's kind of a win-lose situation. He made a lot of people kind of upset, but he brought, you know, brought it to their attention that what they really had was maybe not as good as what they thought they had. This cable, it was, it was advertised as one, two, and three hour fire rating. You'd see it on the back of all these magazines and everything. It was one, two, and three hour fire rating. But they had one of those little stars that you see a lot of advertising have, and then down at the bottom, but that really explained what it was. It's a one, two, three hour firewall penetration rating, which is very similar to the riser test. Basically means, will that, will the fire, if there's a fire in this room, and that cable is penetrating that wall, will that fire get through that penetration? Or will that cable hold up in the, the tire? So that's what that cable did. That's how long that cable lasted. <laughs> Rhode Island, you can imagine what the inspectors in the, in the audience were thinking about. That's what it looks like. It's quick. It's an interlocked MC armor. The Violink MC, you saw that pass around. That's, that's a continuous corrugation. So it almost serves as a conduit. But the interlocked MC, you know, it's, and it's steel, so it did, it did hold up. This is kind of a quote from the U U.S. Fire Administration. It's a special report. Basically what it's saying, I use this, I believe I use it with you guys, the Vegas situation. If you've ever, if you've ever been to Vegas or if you haven't, basically your, your hotels in Vegas, your casinos, they're three, basically a three-pronged building. So what this report's saying is if there's a fire in, say, the West Wing over here, and you know, it's, it's starting to spread, you've got to be able to notify the fire department or the, per the fire safety personnel in that hotel got to be able to notify those people, hey, evacuate, but that maybe they can't necessarily evacuate the building. They want to relocate them. They want to say, you know, get to this other wing. We've got it under control from this point over, so if you can get over here, you're safe. So this that this little quote, and this kind of brought a lot of attention to people and, you know, brought some issues up. This quote kind of sparked, I believe this is one of the things that sparked this new code that's in Article 760. It talks about type CI cables. CI, what it is, it's circuit integrity cable. The definition of it, it's a cable used in a fire alarm system to ensure continued operation of critical circuits during a specified time under fire conditions. What is that specified time? I'll show you in just a second, but that's what a CI cable is. You may have heard about it, you might not hear much about it. Guarantee you will start hearing more about it. There's more and more companies coming out with CI cables because they realize the importance of it. And you guys just saw it with a standard fire alarm cable. For certain applications, certain grant circuits, you know, people will say, well, what do we need a CI cable for? If there's a fire, the equipment's going to actually burn first. And that's right, it probably will. But what are you going to do if there's a fire and it's in that right spot, right where that cable is, and it's not in the equipment? It doesn't matter. That equipment's not going to do anything. Equipment's useless if it doesn't have power feeding to it. This is basically, this talks about where it's required. It just talks about that if it's, if it is a CI cable, it's got to be classified as a CI cable. It's got to have the letter CI on it. The firearm cable, you can see, 
It's listed as a tight FPLR dash CI, which means it's not only a circuit integrity cable, but it's also riser rated, so it will not spread from fourth floor to flame. And basically, like I said, the NEC talks about the actual cable, what it is, but it doesn't say where it's got to be used. That's why a lot of the electrical inspectors don't really enforce it. They don't know, oh, this has to be used in this, this application. They just know, yeah, I've heard of a CI cable, but you know, where, where is it required? So this National Fire Alarm Code, which is where a lot of the, the mandates and everything is enforced, this is, these are the two codes in there that require a two-hour fire rated cable or two-hour fire rated assembly, and that's kind of what drew the CI cable. That's what a CI cable was. A CI cable has to pass a two-hour fire test. The same exact test you just saw. The only difference, it does not go through that ending hose spray. It will not go through that. I'll show you the hose spray that it does go through. It basically goes through a hose spray that will simulate a fire sprinkler coming on and going onto the cable. So it's not that constant pressure. It's not directly hitting that. You can imagine that cable right there would not hold up if it was a cable. It was seeing a fireman's hose or something. But 384114, basically what it's saying, notification of flying circuits. Basically the story I just told you about the Vegas, what that's saying is all the wires from the main trunk of the notification system, going from there to out all the speakers, basically those need to be fired, those need to be protected. And it makes sense when you think about it. But some of your other circuits you might think, well, it's not necessarily that important, but your notification, you've got to have time. You know, you've got to have time to tell people, hey, get out of the building, get to the other side of the building. If you're using the standard fire alarm cable, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. I mean, you just you do not have the time to do it. So that's where it's required. So it's actually required by code. It's not, this isn't something that we're just trying to, you know, play on the hearts of people and say, you know, it really should be needed, but it's it's required by code. So this is just to show you the 384114, number one. The first thing it says is a two-hour rated cable assembly. And CI is classified and defined as a two-hour rated cable assembly. 384133, that's the internet. The internet connecting wire exceeds 100 feet. Basically what it's saying, I guess what that's saying is if it's going longer than 100 feet, that again, that wire has to be fire rated. Because they're assuming that if it's, you know, say it's 200 feet, there's a good chance that that fire could be in that middle section and will not hit your, you know, won't hit your appliance. So. Again, I told you there's a little bit of a difference. Now, Mark, this is from the 90 feet code, right? Uh, this is the 99 National Fire Alarm Company. It was actually first in the 90s. First in the 96. First in the 96. Yeah, fire alarm company. But again, this is the fog of it. Again, it basically, it's going to be like a fire sprinkler. So you can see the cables coming out. See that they're you know, pretty hot. How long is this? That it's test is again two hours of yeah. 18 minutes. Same exact fire test that the MC cable went through. This water spray is the only difference in the two fire tests. You'll notice it looks like a bunch of different, you know, a bunch of different cables or you know, assemblies up there. And when you go to the wall, you have like 10, between 10 and 15 different things you test. You don't test anything the same. You do, you know, you might throw a little bit of a thicker jacket. You might throw, you know, you'll just you'll mix things up to see which one it takes to pass this test. This video is shot. This is the first time you all had ever done this test with the fog nozzle. And they had so much steam in their building, they had to actually stop. That's basically, I mean, it's similar to that. They don't have the, it's not powered right now. They haven't hooked it. After this gets done, it's starting to cool down. You're going to start to see the cable. What you have, if you do pass that exact test right there, now what you have is you have a tight CI cable. Vitalink CI is what that little red cable is called. It's UL listed as a tight FPLR-CI. Once you got the CI, you go and get your riser rating. What you have now, that cable right there is the only, actually not the only, it's the first UL listed type CI cable on the market. So we were the first to pass the test. We did what it took to get there. Now there are companies, you know, that are basically developing the same cable and trying to, you know, they understand it's a growing market, it's something that people are starting to take a serious look at. So we will start hearing more about it. These are kind of the kind of the ingredients of the, of the Lightning CI cable. You got your drain wire, it's a low smoke, zero halogen, polyolefin jacket. 
that jacket will actually burn off in the actual fire. That will dis disintegrate what you're going to have. You're going to have that copper mylar foil shield left with the two conductors with what's called fire rock insulation. Same exact insulation as that Vitalink as the MC cable. So again, it's a silicone, it's a proprietary silicone that when it sees heat, those two conductors are going to turn to, into a ceramic. They're going to act there. But a typical silicone will turn to ash. So you just have your bare conductors. That's going to actually ceramify and harden. And that's what I think that's what enables the cable to maintain its integrity during the fire. Some of the notes on it, it comes in a 16, 14, and 12. We do not make it in an 18. It's, you know, it's a smaller cable, it's a little bit smaller gauge. Uh, the smallest suit we tested was a 16. Maximum application voltage, 72 volts. Installation, same as the standard fire cables. There's no special installation instructions, instructions for a type CI cable. If you want to put it in conduit, then you have to go through, there's, there's an actual system number 22, which you have to support it. Again, just like the MC cable, it's got to be supported a certain way. You know, it's got to meet those requirements, the standard conduit requirements. But you know, if you're going to just run it as an open air cable, there's no special support requirements. The same way you would support and run a standard fire rock cable. Mark, maybe for clarification, the cable would be a 300 volt cable. You're just saying that because of the possibility of exposure to heat, you limit the application to 72 volts. Yes, exactly. Because it would be required to be the standard 300 volt cable for a type FPL. Yeah, yeah it's still classified. It's classified as a 300 volt cable, but the application voltage, which most of your firearm systems, I believe, are they all all the FPL is a 300 volt. Right. A couple other applications: start circuits for generators. Uh, Dave kind of was one of the guys who brought that up to us. Uh, data systems, you know, these are these applications are not just for the CI cable, but for the MC cable. We started to see a lot of data systems, or a lot of companies with their data systems that say, you know, if there is a fire, I want everything of mine backed up. I don't want to take the chance of losing it. You got the internet companies starting up. You know, they can't afford to do that stuff, so they're looking at something like this if they don't run it in concrete and things like that. Security systems, again, where if there's a fire, you don't want certain things to fail on you. And basically, anywhere that in the case of fire, you want that critical circuit. You want that something to continue to operate, whether it be, you know, it could be anything. It could be these little horns, these strobes, you know, in uh, hotels. Well, I think, yeah, I think, you know, fire, the other place we talked about is, uh, you know, elevators for fire command. Uh, power circuits for those is another class of possibility. So there's, there's lots of things out there in buildings that are typically critical that are possible circuit duties for this wiring. Yeah, another example, Mark, would be limit controls in a temperature control system or because limit controls are normally normally close contacts. Mm -hmm. And uh, should those conductors short out, your limit control would not shut down the critical application. Right. High temperature. Right. Temperature. Yeah, there's there's endless numbers of applications with this scale. I mean, the more that we start going in, this is, this is a new product, we're even learning applications for it. The more we go in and talk to people, the more we get actual engineers saying, well, why couldn't you use it here? Why don't you use it for this? This is pretty important. And so there's more and more applications for it. It's designed, you know, it was designed to comply with the code, but, you know, like Sandy just said, there's a lot more applications where it can be looked at, it can be used, and it probably should be used. So. The other possibility is emergency, uh, for any of the emergency lighting systems that are distributed in DC possible for that power circuit to use that wire. So. That's basically that's basically it. I mean it kind of just goes through the, the purpose of that was to show you that you know wiring is usually the weak link, not in just fire alarm systems but in any application. And you know there's other applications, there's other you know cables out there, systems out there, but Vitalink is one of the newest cables out there, so I just want to make you aware of it. You know if you have any questions on it. This is it. This is what it is. You're going to start seeing it. You know, it's the newest thing out there. So, anybody have any questions or anything? Anybody want to add anything? I well, think in the, uh, the UBC right now, <coughs> 97 UBC, I think the only requirement for CI cables in Minnesota right now is the actual control circuitry for combination fire smoke dampers on yeah. a mechanical smoke control system. Mm -hmm. Right now in the state. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. At the 
believe. I don't know. I think, I think that's got the, I think that's true yeah, as far as the state goes. Yeah, yeah, as far as the yeah. state goes, yeah. And the important thing to remember is everything that you that you quoted accurately kills you know, out of the ninety nine right and yes. seventy two, which we have adopted and we're gonna jump into the two thousand and two right uh, international. Uh, so that that'll be our next cycle. So I think that's where the notification appliance circuits and the SLCs and the IDCs on the fire alarm system, I think that's where it'll probably be picked up. And I think there's so a class A circuit requirement also. Is there the same option? And, and I think that from talking to some of the fire marshals around, you know, at least around the cities, it's possible that we'll start seeing some of them go to, you know, pushing for that requirement too with their electrical inspectors on a local basis because I find that in going around talking to people, Seems like almost all of them have thrown away their 93 copebooks. They're all working on at least the 96, if not the 99 copebook. Well, well, they should throw them away. Not <laughs> well, I haven't encouraged it, but I mean, that's what we found out just talking to them. Because when you say they're on the 93, they go, I don't know if we got a 93 on the shelf. And they go look and they come back and they say they don't. So yeah, and that's probably uh, you know, confused because it gets pulled over the uniform fire code of the standards. So that's where it gets made up in the state. But and it's obvious, you know, that the, uh, uh, the benefits of that, right. what they need, and what NFPA is talking about right now, which is the integrity right. of our system, systems picked up by using it. So you know, there's no arguments there. Right. Thank you, What's the difference in cost between this and a regular fire alarm? Uh, pretty big difference. I mean, you have your standard fire alarm cable is probably 10 whole cents a foot, maybe, if that. The right view. Yeah. This is up, you know, in the right around the dollar, a dollar foot for 16. So it is a big difference from standard fire alarm cable. But when you look at your other option of maintaining a two-hour fire heating, which is MI cable 16 to, that's about four dollars a foot. So you know, if you look at an option, we had some, some analysis done. You look at a uh, like a taken from this floor. If you're going to build a two-hour shaft, what it would cost you to build a shaft per floor? So on average, it's about a thousand dollars per floor. To build a two-hour rated shaft with these cables, I mean, you can run this cable for, let's say, it's ten feet, ten dollars. I mean, it's it's a big difference when you look at things like that. So, what we would expect, or the owners would expect to see, uh, an increase in cost of an installed fire alarm system with this cable. Yeah, with the CIR part. Right. right. Yeah. If they're going to use the cable in place of standard fire alarm. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Mark, Matt, and Dave. That was very interesting. Uh, just a few closing notes here. Once you get home, um, if anybody's interested in getting be a member of the Society of Fire Protection Engineers on the national scale. I've got a whole pack of invitations that they sent me. Um, one of the things that, that, that I like about it, uh, being a member, is that they send you this magazine. They just came out with this this year. This is probably like the seventh issue, it says. Uh, it's Fire Protection Engineering Magazine, and it's, uh, it's very well written uh, by a lot of very uh, prominent people in the industry. If anybody wants to look through that, they're welcome to. Um, also, this is probably not very timely, but the Society of Fire Protection Engineers has a professional development week every year. And this year it's in Baltimore. And they put on uh, several different seminar seminars. Uh, there's a fire alarm system design seminar, introduction to sprinkler design for engineers, uh, smoke management, Flammable and Combustible Liquid Symposium, uh, Overview of the International Building Code 2000, Introduction to Computer Fire Modeling, Advanced Computer Fire Modeling, Performance-Based Design, and Changes to NFPA 72 or 13 Seminar. Uh, that's just a few of the things. I'm not going to read everything because they got a lot of smaller programs too, but um, it's taking place the first week of October short notice for, for this meeting. Uh, but if you want to look through it, uh, they do this every year. And it's 
very informative. Uh, I guess the, the other thing I wanted to, to hit on again is we've got the, the price for non-members at $25 for each time you come here, and the price for members is $20. So the way you can save that $5 is by paying a $25 membership due. And so if, if you're interested, you're going to come to a lot of these programs, you can save yourself some money by becoming a member which then helps us with, with our budget for bringing in better speakers. And uh, you know, if you're only going to come to one or two a year, you're probably better off with the $20 program, or excuse me, the $25 time program. But, uh, I think we've got some good programs this year coming up that uh, are pretty interesting, and hopefully we can get more members to come each time, uh, make it more, more cost effective for us too. Like Phil mentioned, uh, I'm on the Education Committee for SFP. We've got a meeting at this professional development seminar, so I should have some information for you as far as what's going on with that. Um, they not only do education during this week, but they do it throughout the year in different cities. So I'll keep you up to date on what's coming up it's close by here or whatever you might be interested there. Otherwise, uh, that's it. Thanks a lot.